Welcome back to Oak Haven. As we start, this is our, our first day of our, our project to do a native landscaping down at the end of our driveway. Um, we kind of see our property as a, um, a sample that people can drive by and they can see what a real woodlands is supposed to look like and compare it to maybe the rest of the neighborhood that's uh, overrun with uh, non-native invasive species. You can drive by and think, oh, that's what, put, that, uh, what uh, a real woodland has the potential to look like. So. Um, we really want to focus on the, the end of the driveway here. Um, as we mentioned in our introductory video, um, our goal on the end of the driveway is a little different from the, in the woodlands. In the woodlands, it's more of a restoration. Here, we're interested in maybe doing a little more planting. We'll bring some things in um, that are still native and non-invasive, um, but we'll talk about that more later. What we're talking about right now is, um, first of all, why we're doing natives. Why, why are we interested in native plants? Why are native plants better than what we can buy at the nursery or other places around? My primary reason for putting in natives is that the native plants um, have have a, a connection with the rest of the ecosystem. They have a connection with the insects and the birds and the animals that are related to them. Uh, when we bring in a non-native plant from Asia, there is no birds that are, know how to use it. There's no insects that know how to use it. Often, the, you know, there may be berries that the birds will eat, but um, really, you know, berries are a small part of the birds' diets, uh, like songbirds and most of the birds around here. Uh, most of them eat insects, and if you look at a lot of the non-native uh, invasive species, they're just not touched by insects. And uh, you can see that because the, the leaves just aren't eaten by insects like, uh, like a lot of our native plants are. So we want something that, that is, does more than just look good, it also functions as part of the ecosystem. That's, that's our goal. So one of the other reasons we want to plant natives is because non-natives have the potential to be invasive. Um, they, because they don't have any natural predators, in, we're in Ohio here, so North America, United States. Um, if you bring in something from Asia, there's none of the natural predators that they have in their, their home territory. You know, burning bush and uh, euonymus and honeysuckle, where, where, they, uh, where they were originally, there's all sorts of factors that are working to keep that in place and, and in check. You bring that over here and there's none of that to keep it in check and it goes wild. And we've been spending a lot of time um, clearing uh, burning bush, which is a serious problem on our property. We've got a lot of little uh, burning bushes growing up. Uh, we just did a video on burning bush. Um, I'd encourage you to check that out. But we want to make sure that whatever we put in here um, is not going to escape out and have a detrimental impact on the, the woodlands. So our first step here was to evaluate what we had. Our goal here is not just the woodland restoration that we do in the rest of the property because um, here we have power lines over our head, we need to keep it down lower, we can't just plant trees and let it grow in. Um, this is going to be a little more of a, a show place, so to speak. So we've done kind of a, a general evaluation of what, what's here already what native things are here and what non-native things are here, um, and decided that the, the first step for us is to get rid of the non-natives. We're not exactly sure what we're gonna do with the natives and what our design is gonna be. We'll draw that out. You know, if you've got suggestions and uh, you know, favorite plants, please leave them in the comments. We, we appreciate the dialogue. But what we know right now is that we don't want the non-native invasives here. So what we're going to do is we're going to clear out the non-natives out of these areas, um, open it up a little bit, kind of see what the canvas looks like. We'll see what natives are there and work around the natives. We have a, a very fortunate situation in that we are not starting with a blank canvas. Um, a lot of people that do native plant landscaping, they're doing a lawn or a landscaping around a house. In that situation, there basically is there's nothing there to, to save. You know, you've got lawn grass or you've got um, other weeds that are growing there. Um, we have some native plants that are already growing here that we can utilize, which is great. But we want to free those up at this point and then work, from what we have, uh, work with what we have. So, um, non-native uh, removal, um, that's something that we do a lot of. So there's lots of videos if you want to find out more about how we get rid of honeysuckle or autumn olive or those things. Um, but we'll, we'll kind of give a brief rundown on that right now uh, as to what we're doing. So these are the tools that we use. Um, we use a lot of the... Uh, chainsaw. This is a DeWalt electric chainsaw. I love working with the electric chainsaw because uh, I spend a lot of time not cutting, walking around, and it's quiet, and I like that. Um, the brush cutter is great, particularly in this situation where a lot of the non-natives, there's um, uh, Japanese honeysuckle, and there's bittersweet, and there's um, 
uh, multiflora rows that are just forming such a tangle that it's really hard to get into the base and cut cut the base. So the brush cutter allows me to reach in there and cut the base and kind of shove things away. Um, it works very well. If you don't have those tools, you know, a lopper and a bow saw work great. They're just a little bit slower, but um, there's something nice about working with hand tools also. You know, when I mentioned that we're cutting things down, we cut things down at the base. We do use an herbicide. Um, I realize that some people are going to say, oh, it's a native landscape. You, you shouldn't be uh, using herbicide because you're throwing poison into the, into the uh, landscape. I disagree, and I'll explain why in a second as soon as this car passes by. We use herbicides um, very carefully, very carefully. So um, we don't just spray randomly, and we don't spread a lot of uh, herbicide around. What we do is we, we cut the stem, and then we just treat the stem with just a small spot of herbicide on that stem, uh, which does a good job of keeping it from re-sprouting. Then that's done, and we can move on, and the, the um, ecosystem can recover and things can grow in there. Um, people ask me, oh, well, doesn't it, doesn't it sterilize the soil? Uh, this is glyphosate. Um, we use a 20% glyphosate for the cut stem um, uh, application. So we, we start with a 40% concentrate and cut it in half to a 20% um, glyphosate, and then we add a dye to it so we can see what we're doing. So when we treat those stems, you can come back during the growing season and you can see that it is still growing in flush amounts around it. Um, it is not like leaching out into the soil. It is, it is only killing that plant and those roots. It does not seem to have any negative impact um, on anything else that, that's growing in the area. Glyphosate gets bound up in the soil. It doesn't, it doesn't leach into the water system. It basically holds on to the, the, uh, the clay particles in the soil until it degrades. I feel very good about using it, uh, again, in a very controlled manner, um, but I get that some people don't want to do that. It's just so much easier to be able to cut it and treat it and be done with it. We also have here a respirator for organic um, vapors. Uh, I will use that if we're aerosoling things, if we're using like a spray bottle, which I try not to do, or a, uh, a sprayer that um, sprays it out like on stilt grass or um, sometimes uh, um, garlic mustard. Um, I try not to do that more than I have to, but if I am spraying it into the air, then I'll wear a respirator. This, because I'm just painting it on the surface, I'm pretty confident that I'm not getting anything um, into my lungs, so I don't bother with a, a respirator. So that talks about our, our process to uh, apply it. What we use is this modified sprayer. Um, we've got a video on how we, we've made this and modified it. So um, it's just a, a regular household sprayer that I've taken the end and I've hose clamped on a sponge and a piece of uh, nylon fabric so I can pressurize the system here and then when I, when I push the, the, um, the handle it just saturates that sprayer and I can dab it on the, uh, the cut stem and um, it applies it in a way that it doesn't, there's no overspray and it's very careful. You can see I, I, I'm using, there's hardly anything in this sprayer and this will be enough to do the whole job because we're not doing um, uh, it doesn't use up very much herbicide at all. So I have a carabiner on the back of this that I hook onto my belt. So that way when I'm spraying I can lean over and it stays at my side. Um, if I'm brush cutting, spraying, cutting with the um, loppers or the, the uh, circular saw, I can lean over, pick things up, and uh, um, it, it's out of the way and then I put a hook on there so that stays where it needs to be. That brings up a point. Normally in the woods when we cut honeysuckle we just let it lie. You know, That's nutrients that I would like to return to the soil. Um, wood on the ground it doesn't bother me too much. If it stays there for a few seasons it doesn't bother me. Uh, this is a little different because it's right out in front of everybody and I don't really want it to be visible. So some people will take a burn, make, and make a burn pile and get rid of that. Uh, what I've chosen to do is just pull things off into the woods where it's not as, as, as visible. Uh, I can do that, you know, 100 feet into the woods and you don't really notice it from the road. And then it'll, um, it, it forms habitat because it, it forms a, a brush pile that um, things can live in there and then it slowly degrades. Um, honeysuckle have uh, produces chemicals that um, are in the leaves that drop into the soil that uh, reduce the or suppress the the germination and the growth of some of our native plants 
Um, people have been concerned, is it okay to leave honeysuckle out in the woods or is that going to suppress the growth and cause problems? I've never seen that causing a problem and taking the, the wood and dumping it places. Uh, so we don't worry about that, we just let it uh, integrate. Uh, we should talk about timing a little bit. Um, I was answering some questions on, on comments on other videos uh, last night and there was a question on when we can use the herbicide and treat. Um, they were saying that they were thinking that it had to be during the, um, the growing season. Right now, we're, it's November 13th, 14th, somewhere around there. Um, and I consider this honeysuckle season. This is a great time to get in there and cut honeysuckle and uh, treat the base of it and any of the shrubs, the uh, autumn olive and other things. Um, it, it seems to work fine all through the winter, um, as long as your, uh, your herbicide isn't freezing. So we will, we will treat um, cut stem um, invasive shrubs through until spring. I forgot to mention, all chainsaws, even though there's no gasoline in this, it's electric, um, it still needs bar oil. All chainsaws have bar oil in it to keep it lubricated on the bar. Um, we, use a, we use Motion Lotion, which is a biodegradable uh, chainsaw oil. Uh, it's something that then, as you're cutting with a chainsaw, it's always spitting off bar oil. I would rather have it be a biodegradable product than an, uh, a petroleum-based product. Uh, that's what our choice is. So we have been in here working on clearing out this area around the, the stream that we talked about that we really want to make an asset, something that when people drive by, they look into the woods and it, and it, it, um, it draws them into the woods. It's a positive thing. So um, I, I'll put in some before and after pictures of what this looked like before. You could not see past this point because of all of the, the uh, bittersweet and um, honeysuckle and other things. So it looks to me amazing. It just like a breath of fresh air in here. Um, it, so, so we will probably do some plantings down here, some, uh, some wetland plantings down in the, the low areas and some other low growth um, plantings up above. We're, we're keeping some things. There's um, the, a black haw and there's red bud and the cedars. There's spice bush in here. All very positive things um, that uh, we're going to work around. We may have to thin them out a little bit. I'm not sure the, whether we want the the cedars and the red buds are growing in the same spot. We'll probably have to choose one or the other as to which we want to have, have there. Just as a, a brief introduction of what some of the plants are that we're dealing with, you can see just the mass here that we're dealing with um, we want to get rid of. But a lot of it, we've got this, um, this is Japanese honeysuckle. It has its black fruit right now and it's laced with uh, frost, so it looks really beautiful right now. Um, Japanese honeysuckle, which entwines everything and gets around, uh, makes it very difficult to walk. Also entwining everything and looking pretty right now is this Asian uh, bittersweet. This is the non-native bittersweet. People ask me about bittersweet and how to tell it from the, the native bittersweet. Um, it has to do with the fruit arrangement here, but uh, you know, to be honest, I've never seen the native bittersweet, even in the wild, so almost everything we have, or I would say that everything that we have is the non-native, and we just um, go ahead and clear it out. So that's the bittersweet. We also have in here the fruit. You can see the red rose hips from the multiflora rose. There's a huge patch here of multiflora rose canes coming up. I don't know if you can see down in there, Julie. Um, this is where I was saying I, I can get in there with a lopper and cut that out, but the the roses have thorns and it's nasty. Um, I can go through with the brush cutter and clear out some of these canes and get to the base, cut it out. So this whole big mass here, I will end up with, you know, four canes of the multiflora rose and several of the Japanese honeysuckle, and I'll treat those with the, the herbicide. It will be just a few small dots in this whole area that will clear this uh, this large area, and then we've got um, uh, the uh, the spice bush here that will be released, um, which will be nice to uh, uh, to showcase a little bit. So we have we have done a lot through this area here, um, 
And again, it was such a tangle of vines that it was really a challenge to get through. And there's still a lot that we're gonna need to, to deal with. Um, but we've uncovered some spice bush in here and there's um, uh, green briar growing up. There's, um, all the, over here we have all of these sycamore trees, which is probably not something we need to have all of the, this whole grove of sycamore trees. So we may thin this out and uh, plant some other things in. Again, with the, the lines above, a grove of sycamore trees aren't going to work necessarily for the landscape. But now there's a line of sight back into the woods, which I think is just wonderful. So here's the first stage, um, kind of clearing the, the, the canvas. Um, again, I would love to hear input from you guys as to what your favorite plants are to put in, things like that. I, I realize that with native plants, it's a little different. Um, when you're looking for uh, you know, non-native plants for a landscape, you can choose from a wide palette because what used to grow in Asia, the, 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 the landscapers, the, um, um, the nursery people, they produce a lot of things that will grow pretty much anywhere in the United States. Um, native plants are pretty more are more exacting. Uh, you need to find things that are right for your habitat. But um, I'm I'm interested in the conversation. So in future videos, we'll go into more about what our design is, um, what native plants we choose, uh, what cho what we don't choose, uh, why we choose what we choose, uh, what we think about uh, cultivars. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, follow along in the videos. And again, uh, we'd like to hear your input. Thanks for coming along.